This is exactly right. When it comes to holiday gifting, there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution, especially when you're looking to give something special. That's where StoryWorth comes in. With StoryWorth, you can celebrate the people you care about with a gift as special and unique as your relationship with them. StoryWorth is an online service that helps you and your loved ones preserve precious memories and stories for years to come. Every week, StoryWorth emails your relative or friend a thought-provoking question of your choice from their vast pool of possible prompts. After one year, StoryWorth will compile all your loved ones' stories, including photos, into a beautiful keepsake book that you'll be able to share and revisit for years to come. StoryWorth, I think, is one of my all-time favorite gifts. I have absolutely loved reading my mom's stories and seeing her pictures from her childhood. I will cherish it forever. With StoryWorth, you are giving those you love most a thoughtful personal gift from the heart and preserving their memories and stories for years to come. Go to storyworth.com slash this podcast and save $10 on your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash this podcast to save $10 on your first purchase. You don't ride an elevator for the music or pick an airline for the movies. So when it comes to audio entertainment, it makes sense to choose Audible. It's the home for stories told by the biggest stars like Ethan Hawke, Kerry Washington, and Kevin Hart. Audible has an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries and thrillers, motivation, science, business, and more. Members also get full access to a growing selection of included audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts. You can download or stream included titles all you want. I love listening to Audible while I'm doing chores around the house or cooking. Right now I'm listening to Cloud Cuckoo Land and I'm absolutely loving it. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash this podcast or text this podcast to 500-500. That's audible.com slash this podcast or text this podcast to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Audible.com slash this podcast. Towards the end of September 1827, a disease of a very singular character suddenly made its appearance in the island of St. Thomas and attacked almost every individual in the town, which contains a population of about 12,000 souls. The disease appeared so suddenly and spread with such rapidity, and the suffering attending it was so great that at first it caused universal alarm and was considered a sort of plague that would probably ravage the whole country. It was soon, however, discovered that although a very painful, it was by no means a dangerous disease, and that if the attack was rapid, the recovery was no less speedy. This at least was the general belief, until longer experience showed the troublesome nature of the secondary pains that constitute the third stage of the disorder. The most usual mode of attack was the following. A person in perfect health would suddenly feel a stiffness amounting almost to a pain in one of his fingers, and most frequently his little finger. The stiffness increased and was accompanied by an intense degree of pain, which spread rapidly over the whole hand and up the arm to the shoulder. The fingers of both hands in a few hours became swelled, stiff, and painful, preventing all attempts at bending the joints. This was followed in a short time by restlessness, depression of spirits, and a degree of nausea, ending in some cases in vomiting. Then came on shivering, succeeded by fever, great heat of skin, intense headache, most acute pain in the back, knees, ankles, and in short, in every joint. But perhaps the most distressing symptom of this stage was the intense pain in the eyeballs. In every case where the first stage was in any degree well marked, patients declared that they had never experienced nor could have conceived pains equal to what they felt in this fever. Not one inch of the body from head to foot was exempt from suffering. An efflorescence was perceived at this time to begin at the palms of the hands and to spread over the whole body. After the eruptive stage, the patient began to recover his spirits and his strength, but in many cases, a complete want of taste remained for some days. Many people did not get rid of the pains in the joints for many weeks. In general, however, the disease gave a degree of respite for three, four, and even in some cases six weeks, and then attacked the joints with more pain and paralysis than at first. I conclude with the hope that I have done my duty in endeavoring to record a disease attended with so many curious symptoms as justly to challenge the attention of every medical man, and particularly of those who are destined to practice in tropical countries.
love these like old timey descriptions, Erin, <laughs> so much. I love that. So that was excerpted from this paper published in 1828 by wow. George Stedman. Yeah titled Some Account of an Anomalous Disease Which Raged in the Islands of St. Thomas and Santa Cruz in the West Indies during the months of September, October, November, December, and January 1827 to 1828. I guess they didn't have character limits and titles back then. <laughs> the most descriptive and specific title. Yeah. Yeah. So that, like, that whole paper, which is available online, is an interesting read. There's so much more detailed there, but oh, I, I just pulled little excerpts that I thought were most descriptive of the topic of today's episode, which is chikungunya virus. Chikungunya virus. Hi, I'm Erin Welsh. And I'm Erin Almond Updike. And this is This Podcast Will Kill You. Welcome to Is this our first mosquito borne virus of our whole season? Um, I think so. Wow. I can't keep track anymore, Erin. I know. Same. I feel like we've done, I mean, we've done like some lice and things. Yeah. We've done some vectors. Yeah. Well, but anyways. yeah, mosquito-borne virus, I, I think so. I'm excited. It's going to be a good one. It is. I didn't really know anything about chikungunya besides the name before mm -hmm. getting into this. And yeah, I'm very curious to hear how the biology works. I know. I remember in 2013 and 2014 when the big outbreaks were happening in the Americas and being like, what's going to happen with chikungunya? And then that was it. Yeah. And I never really learned much more about it. So mm -hmm. it was it was fun to get to research. Yeah. But first, it's quarantini time. It's quarantini time. What are we drinking this week? We're drinking head, shoulders, knees and toes. <laughs> knees and toes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so we are drinking head, shoulders, knees, and toes mm -hmm. because one of the hallmark symptoms of chikungunya virus, as you heard in our firsthand account, is joint pain and headache. Yep. Pretty, pretty severe, as we'll discuss. <laughs> Very severe. Yeah. Yeah. So what is in head, shoulders, knees, and toes? Oh, it's a perfect little fall concoction. We've got some apple cider, some orange, and some mezcal for smokiness. Yeah. And also as a callback to dengue, mm -hmm. our dengue episode and our dengue quarantini, which had mezcal in it. And because yeah. you're going to hear a lot about Dengue. <laughs> I know. There'll be a lot Today. of compare, contrast, dengue, chikungunya, et cetera. So it makes sense. So we called back to it. We'll post the full <laughs> recipe <laughs> for our quarantini, as well as our non-alcoholic placebo burrito on our website, thispodcastwillkillyou.com, and all of our social media channels. Before we dive into the episode, of course, like the routine, check out our website, mm -hmm, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. There's a lot of stuff there. But also, this is our second to last episode of season five. What? Yeah. There's just one more coming out after this. Mm -hmm. But don't worry. We will be back. We're just going to take a break and not read about disease stuff for a minute. I mean, we'll probably still read about disease stuff, but like just quietly to ourselves. Actually, that's true. And, <laughs> and then we'll just text each other. Exactly. <laughs> Well, in any case, we will be back. And so make sure you follow us on all of our social media accounts so that you know when we are on our way back. And if you have suggestions that you really want to hear for next season, send them our way. Well, with that, Erin, shall we get into chikungunya virus? Let's do it. Right after this break. This podcast will kill you is brought to you in part by BetterHelp. Life can be complicated, messy, and challenging at times, and when that happens, it's normal to feel stuck or not like yourself. But everyone deserves to feel their best, and BetterHelp makes it easy to get started. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash this podcast. That's betterhelp.com slash this podcast. I'm Carrie Mulligan, the host of I Hear Fear, a new anthology series of terror. The stories in this podcast are things that people don't want to talk about when the sun's out and the world's supposed to make sense. 
But you and I know better, don't we? We know that the best horror stories are the ones we tell each other in the dark. So turn off your lights and close your eyes. In each episode of I Hear Fear, you'll be treated to a new psychological thriller. A forest monster who lures teens into the woods and never lets them return. A line of beauty products that takes the search for youth to dark extremes. And an EDM party that turns deadly when the DJ takes over more than just the dance floor. Strap in as these twisted stories and paranormal events take you on a suspenseful and thrilling ride. I Hear Fear will introduce immersive horror and lead you straight into the heart of darkness. Hey, Prime members, listen to the Amazon Music exclusive podcast, I Hear Fear, in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. Chikungunya virus is an arbovirus, which means a virus transmitted by arthropod vectors, and in this case, like we said, mosquitoes. I'm probably going to end up talking about the two main mosquito vectors more than anyone bargained for. It's going to be fun. I'm I'm so glad because I did a little <laughs> bit of diving into the ecology, and I was like, I don't know where this goes in the history section. Hopefully, Erin will talk about I, it. <laughs> well, I found myself thinking so much of Allie and Allison in our old lab and being like, I wish I could call and be like, can you tell me about their ecology? <laughs> Anyways, so let's get into it, shall we? Chikungunya virus is in the genus Alpha virus in the family Togaviridae. And these viruses, they're RNA viruses, the majority of which are arboviruses. They are transmitted by mosquitoes and other vectors. A few that people may have heard of include Ross River virus Mm -hmm. and Western and Eastern equine encephalitis viruses. One thing I thought was interesting about alpha viruses in general is that at least one of the papers that I was reading was talking about how for a lot of alpha viruses, humans and our domestic animals are often considered dead end hosts. So we aren't necessarily like the evolutionary hosts for these pathogens. Uh, Which is, I think, very interesting, especially because I'm going to end up comparing and contrasting chikungunya virus in this episode, because it's compared a lot in the literature, to a few other arboviruses like dengue, Zika virus, yellow fever virus. All of those viruses are not in the alpha virus family. Those are all flaviviruses, so a completely different family of viruses, some of which are very human-specific, like yellow fever, or can cause disease in animals and humans kind of equally. That's interesting that humans are considered the dead end host for alpha viruses. Is that because of like viremia and mosquitoes not being able to get enough virus? Or is it because mosquitoes aren't biting as much? Yeah, I think both from what I could tell. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But as we'll see, that's not the case for chikungunya. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the two major vector species of chikungunya virus are mosquitoes that might be familiar to longtime listeners. They are mosquitoes in the genus Aedes, particularly Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti. These are the same mosquitoes that are responsible for the transmission of dengue fever, of yellow fever, and of Zika virus, among many others. There are a lot of other species of Aedes mosquitoes that can also transmit chikungunya, as well as perhaps some species of Culex that have been found to be infected. But predominantly, especially for humans, it's Albopictus and Aegypti, and that's probably how I'll refer to them throughout this episode. And like many of our mosquito-borne viral and other pathogens, this life cycle can be a little bit complicated, but it goes a little something like this. The mosquito takes a bite of an infected blood meal from an animal or a human in the case of chikungunya. The virus has to travel through the guts of that mosquito, disseminate through the gut wall of the mosquito, travel through the hemolymph and invade the salivary glands where they can replicate. And this process for chikungunya virus within the mosquito takes between two and five days to happen. Okay. 
So what that means is that the adult mosquito, after it takes its first blood meal, has to live at least two to five days to then be infectious to another person. I have a question about mosquito longevity. Oh, so glad. Erin has so many fun facts about these mosquitoes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. How long on average do the different species, Albopictus and Aegypti, live? So these mosquitoes take about a week to develop from egg into adult. But once they are adults, they can live for four to six weeks. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Which is a lot of very long biting potential. It sure is. And it's only female mosquitoes that bite. They have to take a blood meal in order to make eggs, in order to lay a brood. And Aedes mosquitoes, if they are able to take an entire blood meal, and there are differences between Aedes aegypti and Albopictus in terms of like how often they lay eggs and things like that. But if they took a whole entire blood meal, they might be able to go several days between feedings. But what often happens is that they get interrupted really frequently during their feedings. So they don't get a whole blood meal at once. So they might bite and then bite and then bite and then bite in order to get enough blood to be able to make an egg brood. So it's not like one blood meal or one feeding sesh, one infected person. It could be five feeding seshes to get your you know, stomach full and mm-hmm. you infect five people. So is there, yeah, like viral load, infectious dose, like, you know, does that play a role in it as well? Great question. I totally don't have answers for you on that. Like how many viral particles does a mosquito have in their salivary glands and how many are they injecting with each feed? I have no idea. But at least in theory, if this mosquito is biting many different hosts, not only is that many opportunities to become infected, but it's also many opportunities to transmit that pathogen. Makes sense. And... Wow. But going back to the timeline of it, so two to five days for that process of dissemination through the guts before a mosquito becomes infectious. Here we start to compare contrast something like chikungunya with something like dengue virus. Dengue virus takes eight to 10 days before it's transmissible in the adult mosquito. So already you have a mosquito that doesn't have to live nearly as long before it can start infecting other people. Interesting. So I guess that would probably play a big role in how fast an epidemic or an outbreak happens. Mm, Sure could. Mm -hmm. All right. So continuing on in our life cycle, once that mosquito is infectious, it takes another blood meal and then those viruses are injected from the salivary glands into our subcutaneous tissues. Those viruses make their way into our bloodstream They infect a number of different cells. They infect our fibroblast cells. They can replicate in our skin cells. They make their way into our liver and into our joints where they infect a variety of cells. I'm going to pause in the life cycle here because I want to talk a little bit more about these two species of mosquito, even though we've already kind of like dove into some of the fun bits. Mm -hmm. These two species of mosquito, Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti. We've talked about them a lot because we've done Zika, we've done yellow fever, we've done dengue. These mosquitoes are particularly good, particularly well adapted to rural, urban, and human-built environments, especially Aedes aegypti. This is a mosquito that like just loves humans and our urban environments. These two mosquito species are generally both container breeding mosquitoes, so they do really well in things like old tires or that pot you forgot about, that one pothole in your street that absolutely never drains, your neighbor's (laughs) pool that they drained three years ago, but they never filled it, so there's just like an inch of water in there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Also tree holes in more like suburban or rural environments, etc. Any tiny amount of standing water is enough for Aedes aegypti and Albopictus both to be able to breed and survive. These two mosquitoes are also very aggressive. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're really aggressive biters, especially for humans, like they really like humans. And especially Aedes albopictus tend to be 
more diurnal than most mosquito species. So they can primarily bite during the daytime, in the mornings and in the evenings. So they're really difficult to avoid. And things like bed nets that are often used to protect against other mosquito species that bite at night don't do anything to prevent the bites of Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti. Right. And like I said, they can complete their entire initial life cycle in as little as a week from egg all the way to adult. So in times of plenty in terms of rainfall, like the rainy season, you have many, many broods of mosquitoes over and over hatching and going out in search of new blood meals. But at the same time, like many mosquito species, these eggs can dry out completely and then survive until the next rainfall season. That's why they can do so well in these small containers of water that might dry out completely. They can just hang on. It's amazing, and I respect it, but I also hate it. (laughs) I know, I know, I know. So that's just kind of some fun facts about Aedes aegypti and Albopictus. I'll probably talk more about them in the current event section because they're also really important invasive species worldwide, um, especially Aedes albopictus. Yeah. And so, and they spread so many different diseases that they're an incredibly important source of vector borne disease. Mm -hmm. But if that isn't enough, Chikungunya virus can also be spread via vertical transmission within the mosquito, meaning it can pass into the eggs and result in larvae and therefore adults that are already infected. It's horrible. It's terrible. (laughs) I didn't, I don't know the rate at which this happens, um, but it definitely happens. And just to make it even worse, Males who become infected at birth, males do not blood feed, so they can't become infected as adults, but they can be born infected and can infect females during the mating process. So this virus is just really good at spreading through these mosquitoes. And that's just for Aedes aegypti, right? The vertical transmission? I I saw it primarily for Aedes aegypti. Okay. Yeah. And like I said, chikungunya virus is more than just a human virus. So these mosquitoes can become infected by biting a huge variety of mammals, including rodents, bats, non-human primates, but also even birds and reptiles that can become infected and harbor chikungunya virus. I didn't get a sense, and I think that because this disease has largely been an outbreak disease... The outbreak patterns in humans tend to be from human to vector to human transmission. So like humans being the primary reservoir, largely because these two species of mosquitoes do really like to bite humans. So I didn't get a sense of what the natural reservoirs likely are across the globe, but it probably varies in different parts of the world. Yeah. It seems like historically they found it in non-human primates. And then the more yeah. sampling they did, the more they found in other species as, as you know, often happen. happens. Yeah. <laughs> so all of that is just the virus, the mosquitoes, and the transmission. Let's get into the disease that chikungunya causes, shall we? Let's do it. So once a person gets bitten and this mosquito injects you full of virus, the incubation period tends to be about two to four days. Different papers report slightly different ranges, but that's about the average. I feel like that's a pretty tight range. It is. I mean, it does range from like one to 12, but I think... Okay. (laughs) Never mind. I take it back. I know. I know. But in general, like most (laughs) papers consensus, two to four, some like to say three to seven just to hedge their bets. Okay. Okay. (laughs) But symptom onset tends to be abrupt and severe. The firsthand account that we read was actually a pretty decent description of what I'm about to talk about, especially when you consider that was from the 1800s. So love that. The symptoms tend to start with a fever, of course, headache, back pain, Very, very severe joint pain and in potentially any joint, ankles, wrists, fingers, hips, knees, large joints, small joints. And it does tend to be like so severe that it is difficult to bear and people often will have like rigors and be bent over and just in an excruciating amount of pain. Mm 
about 50% of people-ish will also have some kind of skin involvement. The most common rash is a very itchy, red, splotchy, kind of what I think of as just a very generic viral looking rash. So like little red splotches with bumps in the middle, what we call maculopapular. And this can be across the chest, the stomach, the back. I know the firsthand account mentioned the palms, but I don't think that we tend to see that very commonly. What's interesting is that in children, the rash can often be quite different with more of a blistering appearance, like very large blisters across the whole skin. Or even with petechiae, which are those tiny little purple spots that mean that you're having little tiny pinpoint bleeds underneath your skin. Why is it different? Just immune system stuff? Yeah. Great question. No clue. (laughs) (laughs) And in general, chikungunya fever tends to be considered a self-limited condition. Usually, these symptoms are going to resolve in 7 to 10 days, which is a long time to be this sick. However, this incredibly painful arthritis can in some cases persist for months or even years afterwards. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's horrible. And what's truly awful is that this happens in up to 30 to 40% of people who are infected with chikungunya virus. Whoa. So it's a huge number. We don't know exactly what causes this chronic joint pain, this chronic arthritis. But so far, it's not thought to be due to chronic infection. Okay. Because in general, when we've tried to study it, people have not been able to isolate virus from the joint fluid of people with this chronic arthritis as a result of chikungunya. So it's thought to likely be something that's immune-mediated, which is something that we see with other arboviral, viral, and bacterial infections as well. And one of those things that we still just don't really understand. What causes the acute joint pain? Oh, great question, Erin. To say that we don't really understand the pathophysiology of chikungunya virus, I think, is an understatement. And I (laughs) always say that we don't understand things. Um, In small animal studies, we see that it's primarily musculoskeletal tissues that are infected by this virus, especially muscles surrounding joints, as well as skin fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are this like generic cell type that are involved in connective tissue formation. And so since this is a virus that has to infect our cells in order to replicate, these are the cell types, these fibroblasts and these muscle cells that they tend to infect and replicate in. There is some evidence from these, again, animal studies that mice who lack T cells, especially certain subsets of T cells, have much less severe joint swelling and tissue damage as a result of this viral infection. Hmm. So it's thought that perhaps it's at least in part a T cell mediated response that causes all of this joint pain and inflammation in those spaces because that's where the virus is actually infecting. And that's like the muscle There's like muscle involvement? It can infect muscle cells. It doesn't mean that the inflammation will be in the muscles necessarily. But there's also often a lot of muscle pain with chikungunya as well. So this only because we just covered gout. How does (laughs) how does this joint pain differ from gout joint pain? What a fun question. So gout tends to be a very one joint at a time or a few joints at a time. This is every joint in your body. There's similarities in that in both of them, a lot of the pain is going to be driven by the inflammation, which is driven by our immune response to some kind of stressor. In this case, we think that it is the virus infecting particular cells, fibroblasts, muscle cells, other cells near and around our joints that then cause a lot of inflammation that then cause a lot of pain. Okay. The difference in gout, of course, is that we know exactly what those particular drivers are. See our gout episode for that. Okay, (laughs) interesting. But I do think it's important to talk about this pain and especially the chronicity that this pain can have. This can last for weeks to months to potentially years after this acute infection. And it can be 
debilitating. And chikungunya virus is often portrayed as a much less virulent pathogen compared to other arboviruses like yellow fever or dengue. And in a lot of ways, it is. In general, the estimated case fatality rates for chikungunya are less than 1%. It was thought, especially historically, to be very, very rare to die from chikungunya, Although with more recent outbreaks, we have seen an increase in mortality, especially in the very old, the very young, or the otherwise immunocompromised. So that less than 1% is probably an underestimate. But it certainly historically has been much less virulent than dengue fever, which if it causes dengue shock syndrome, has a mortality rate of 20% or more, or mm-hmm. yellow fever, which has a case fatality rate between 10 and 50% or more. Oh my more. gosh, yeah. So when you compare those, then yes, chikungunya seems relatively benign. But months or years of debilitating joint pain can cause disability. It can cause inability to work, which might mean inability to feed your family. So it does have really serious consequences. So I want to emphasize that it's not a benign illness by any means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chikungunya can also infect people during pregnancy. Of course, you can be infected at any point in your life. It doesn't seem to cross the placenta and cause fetal infection the way that something like Zika virus does. But it can cause neonatal infections if someone is highly viremic, like has an acute infection at delivery. And those can actually be very severe and have resulted in neonatal deaths. Okay. When it comes to whether or not you can have an asymptomatic infection, which is something that we talk a lot about, especially in viral diseases or mosquito-borne diseases. I don't know who to believe in terms of how many (laughs) asymptomatic cases there are. A lot of papers that I read, I would say the majority estimate that it's actually very rare to have an asymptomatic infection, which is quite different than something like dengue or Zika. Yeah, I think I saw like a CDC cheat sheet that was like three in four chikungunya cases are symptomatic and Mm -hmm. one in four dengue are symptomatic. Yeah, it's estimated that anywhere from like five to 25 percent, but most of the estimates I saw were about 15 percent of people will be asymptomatic, which is pretty low. Yeah, Um, But then some of the papers were like lots of asymptomatic. And I'm like, I I don't know. (laughs) But anyways, I think it's low compared to dengue, compared to Zika, as far as we can tell. So joint pain is like the hallmark symptom of chikungunya. Are there any other organs that are involved? Great question. There doesn't tend to be a ton of organ involvement that results in organ damage that we would then see on things like lab results or resulting in like kidney failure, liver failure, which I think is why it's historically been considered a pretty mild disease. Mm -hmm. It can and has in more recent outbreaks caused neurologic effects, um, but again, tends to do that at a much lower rate than something like Zika. Right. It's something that you would commonly see in huge outbreaks, but Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's say that there's an outbreak of what is suspected to be chikungunya Mm -hmm. and someone is sick with what is probably chikungunya. What do they do? What happens? Great question. So in terms of treatment, it's mostly supportive care. We don't have any particular antivirals. We don't have any specific treatments targeted towards chikungunya virus. Um, most of what you'll see online is Tylenol. Huh. That's it. Tylenol. What's interesting about that is that public health agencies do tend to specify Tylenol over any other things like NSAIDs, like ibuprofen. And the reason for that is because clinically during outbreaks, both because the symptoms can be very nonspecific in the acute phase, they can overlap a lot and these two viruses tend to occur in the same areas. Dengue and chikungunya virus can be difficult to tell apart. And NSAIDs can be very dangerous in dengue because it can lead to bleeding. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so for that reason, it's like, if you're not sure, just Tylenol. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
And like many neglected tropical diseases, we don't have the best of diagnostics for chikungunya either. But they exist, you know. <laughs> <We're> they, <good>. yeah. <laughs> so that is chikungunya and its biology or what I know about it. So, Erin, <laughs> tell me, how did, where did this virus come from? Why does it infect us? Well, Tell me about it. I don't know if I can answer that second one, but I'll certainly <laughs> try for the first right after this break. Cherie Warren was a young mother looking for a fresh start. Recently divorced, she had moved out, found a great new job, and even found a new boyfriend. She was happy for the first time in a long time. But on a crisp October evening after a long day, Cherie said goodbye to her coworkers, left the office, and was never heard from again. All eyes quickly turned toward her ex-husband. He had previously lured another woman into the woods, beating her with a tire iron. But there was another man that piqued the interest of investigators, Cherie's new boyfriend. He was a former reserve police officer with a dark history of sexual violence. The two men closest to Cherie swore they loved her and promised to protect her. But did one of them murder her? In season three of the hit true crime podcast, Cold, host Dave Colley digs into what really happened to Cherie. And now Prime members can listen to the Amazon Music exclusive podcast, Cold, in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. Goodbye. Goodbye. The story of chikungunya virus, or at least part of the story of this virus, will probably sound a bit familiar to you. Erin, uh, it definitely will for you, because we have recorded dengue and Zika episodes, <laughs> and you just talked about all the similarities. But for our listeners, too, not just the biology or the transmission or the epidemiology of these viruses will sound similar, but also a bit of the history, I think. Okay. We'll sound a little bit echoes of each other. All mosquito-borne viruses, all on the rise, all recently attracting more attention and generating more headlines than historically they used to due to their recent geographic spread into new regions, especially regions like Europe and North America, where the disease has changed from being an over-there disease to a wait, it's here now, one. And with dengue and chikungunya especially, the similarities extend beyond epidemiology and disease ecology and down into the clinical side of things, since they can cause a lot of the same symptoms, as well as their histories, which, as I'll talk about, have blended together and are kind of in the process of being rewritten. Oof, I love it. Yeah. But with as many similarities as these diseases share, they are also distinct in many ways that play a huge role in their transmission, their evolution, and in the way that public health efforts are focused. And I'm not going to do a thorough compare and contrast between chikungunya and like dengue, mm. although I may call on you to help me, Erin, and some of these, <laughs> as we'll get to the section where I'm like going to be like, all right, let's... Take a closer look. Mm -hmm. But I do, in researching for this, it struck me that these arboviruses are often kind of lumped together and talked about as a single entity. And I feel like it's just as important to remember what differences among these infections can tell us as it is to ask what their similarities can say about these diseases. Yeah. And I think that throughout this episode, we'll have the opportunity to do both. But first things first, Erin, you asked, as you always do, where this virus came from. And it's a great question that I'm only going to be able to answer in part. Okay. Most papers I read for this episode, if they mentioned the evolutionary origin of chikungunya virus at all, it was just to say that it wasn't clear when or where this virus emerged, right? Love it. Of course. One paper gave a not super narrow estimate that the ancestor of chikungunya virus emerged fairly recently, maybe as recently as 1850 or as far back as the year 650 CE. Oh. 
It's like, <laughs> which like in the scheme of things is not a big range, but it does seem like a big range. It's a that's still a big range. It's I a mean, big range. Yeah. It's a big range. But there was a more recent paper that examined the different lineages of the chikungunya virus and estimated that the virus emerged somewhere in Central or East Africa around 300 to 500 years ago. Okay. And the East Central South African lineage, which I think is the predominant one in a lot of places, that appeared around 1903 and then gave rise to the West African and Asian genotypes or lineages in the decades after. Wow. Yeah. So it's like pretty, pretty recent. And the most recent lineage, the Indian Ocean lineage, only emerged in the very early 2000s. I know. I can't wait to talk about it. It's so... Mind-blowing, it really is. We'll get into it later. <laughs> but long story short, this seems to be a relatively new virus whose ancestors infected mosquitoes and non-human primates and other vertebrates with occasional spillover into humans from this enzootic cycle. And then at some point, this virus diverged into chikungunya virus transmitted by 80s mosquitoes and O Nyong Nyong virus. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but that's transmitted by Anopheles mosquitoes. As humans began to settle in larger groups and especially began to store water, even you didn't even have to store that much of it, mm -hmm. that provided opportunities for the evolution of the more domestic 80s Aegypti, Aegypti mosquito subspecies, which hung around these settlements and allowed for human to human transmission of chikungunya. So it's maintained in just humans and mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And that's in contrast, of course, to the spillover into humans from the enzootic cycle when a bridge vector species of mosquito, one that feeds on both humans and non-human primates or other vertebrate reservoirs, bites a human and transmits the virus. Very much like dengue, honestly. It, it is very much like dengue. I mean, and it's much it's much like a lot of other mm -hmm. mosquito-borne viruses or mosquito-borne infections. Like yeah. there's this enzootic cycle that just happens all the time in the background, and then it happens to spill over into humans, and then depending on the circumstances, that can cause this big outbreak. Yep. And so these big outbreaks would happen from time to time, and if fed initially by the spillover, and then it would just sweep through the population – until most people became immune, and then the virus would go quiet for a while. Mm -hmm. And this is essentially how the cycle would have continued for hundreds of years until its discovery in 1952. In July of that year, a seemingly new disease began popping up in the Makande Plateau's region in Tanzania. Within two or three weeks of the first case appearing in a village, 60 to 80 percent of the population became infected. Whoa. With some households reporting a 100% infection rate. That is impressively fast and impressively infectious. Yes. I, I honestly, I just couldn't get over it. Well, and I think it so does lend credence to this idea that there's not a lot of asymptomatic infections. Yes, mm -hmm. totally. The disease seemed to come on suddenly with the rapid development of a high fever and these horrible joint pains. Quote, the pain was frightening in its severity, completely immobilizing many patients and preventing sleep in the first few days of the illness. It was intensified by movement and localized in larger joints. In some cases, there was also severe backache. Morphia was the only analgesic which was found to modify the pain. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah. No one in the region could remember a similar epidemic ever occurring there, and so this disease was given a new name from the Makande dialect, chikungunya, meaning that which bends up, or I've also seen it as the disease that bends up the joints. Mm. No one who had the disease got it a second time. Wow. And people said, you either definitely had it or you definitely did not. There mm. was just... No in between. No in between, Yeah. Researchers immediately suspected that it was mosquito-borne, or at least transmitted by some blood-sucking arthropod vector, both due to its pattern of transmission, um, its occurrence in the rainy season, and its similarity to dengue fever. Mm. In one of these papers reporting the initial outbreak, quote, clinically indistinguishable from dengue if mm. allowance is made for the inherent variability of that disease. Because mm -hmm. dengue is like clinically quite diverse. Super variable, yeah. 
Studies were carried out where researchers collected blood-feeding arthropods from all around the villages where the outbreak occurred, and sure enough, all signs pointed to Aedes aegypti. Because of the clinical similarity to dengue, people figured that when they found the virus, it was just going to be like a new subtype or a new strain of the dengue virus. But analysis of serum samples collected showed that it seemed to be a new kind of virus, not a dengue virus. Mm -hmm. And so it got to keep the name that it got during this first outbreak, Hmm. chikungunya. And maybe it's because we've done so many episodes where the story goes something like, the disease was first recognized in ancient times and people wrote about (laughs) it for hundreds of years, but no one knew what caused it or how it was transmitted until recently. But I just think it's so amazing that within a few years of its first appearance, we had a name, we had a clinical picture, we had a vector and a causative agent for this new disease. Yeah. I mean, and it shows how far we'd come by the 1950s in terms of microbiology. Mm -hmm. If you cast your mind back to our dengue episode, you may remember that the first epidemics of dengue were described in the late 1700s, and it took another 100 years and then some before it was linked to mosquitoes, and decades after that before the virus was identified and like Mm. classified. And here we are with chikungunya, learning all that and more about this brand new disease in just a few years. Hmm. It's amazing. Or is it? No, it is. (laughs) But maybe (laughs) things aren't as simple as I presented them. Well, Erin, I'm just I'm waiting for you to drop the other shoe um, because I know (laughs) that our firsthand account was from the 1800s. So (gasps) yes. Mm -hmm. Um, On that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> maybe chicken gunya isn't as brand new as we thought it was. Maybe 1952 was not the year of chicken gunya first being discovered. Mm-hmm. Maybe some of those historical outbreaks of dengue weren't caused by the dengue virus after all, but rather the chicken gunya virus. Mm-hmm. Of course, that doesn't take away from how like incredible it is to have built that knowledge about the seemingly new totally. disease so quickly. Yeah, totally. But I did want to take some time to revisit the early history of dengue and see if maybe what people thought was dengue was actually chikungunya. Mm-mm. And this isn't something that I it, like came up with on my own. I there are <laughs> lots of papers <laughs> that have been looking into this possibility for, you know, decades and um And they've come up with some pretty convincing evidence. All right. So a 1971 paper by Donald Carey titled Chikungunya and Dengue, a case of mistaken identity, Mm. takes a closer look at many so-called dengue epidemics since the 18th century and uses clinical descriptions from eyewitnesses to see whether it seems more in line with dengue or chikungunya. Because although the two diseases do bear many similarities and can be quite varied in terms of symptom presentation, there do seem to be some distinguishing features between the two. Like one of them is this lingering, long lingering joint pain in chikungunya, and also just the fact that dengue has a much higher mortality rate. And so these differences would be a lot more easily seen in outbreaks and epidemics when you can look at a whole bunch of people and see patterns emerge rather than looking at two people side by side that like both have kind of a rash, both yeah. have headaches joint pain, and joint pains fever. and a fever. And yeah. Live in an area with 80s aegypti and 80s albopictus. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm really excited for this, Erin, because I do think it's really important. Many of the clinical papers written recently talk a lot about how difficult it is to distinguish chikungunya and dengue, say, in the moment during a chikungunya outbreak or a dengue outbreak when you don't know which one is at play or if both are happening simultaneously, which can absolutely right. happen. Yeah. Um, so it is really interesting to be able to take a step back and look at things historically because there are patterns that emerge when you're able to look not at an individual person, but at a population. Yep. Ooh, that it. just actually made me wonder, though, is there any in places where both the viruses co-occur? Is there competition between them within mosquitoes? Oh, my gosh, Erin, such a good question. There is some evidence in one of the papers that I read that especially in 80s 
I think it's an 80s albopictus that some of the mutations that I know you'll talk about actually yeah. might facilitate co-infection <gasps> with dengue and chikungunya. It's terrifying. What? It's terrifying. Okay. That is really terrifying. Yeah. But anyways, sorry. Anyways, no, no. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the other thing about looking historically at dengue and chikungunya is that 80s Egypti achieved a global distribution since the 1600s or yeah. so. Yeah. And that greatly expanded the range of dengue and yellow fever. So it seems pretty plausible that chikungunya, which does the same transmission cycle, more or less, could have been another virus carried by these mosquitoes. Yeah. In 1779, there was an outbreak of something called knuckle courts or knuckle joint fever in okay. present day Jakarta. And the description written by David Bylon does suggest, who was witness at the time, does suggest chikungunya. Quote, I noticed a gnawing pain in my right hand and in the joints of the hand and arm, which gradually increased, extending to the shoulder and then over my whole body, so that at nine o'clock that evening, I was in bed with a high fever. I had a restless and sleepless night, suffering severe pains over the entire body, especially in the legs and arms and in the joints. This is a brief notice concerning a very well-known disease, which, however, in the memory of man here in Batavia, has never reached an epidemic, and which has, therefore, seemed wondrous to the inhabitants. Hmm. Around this time, an outbreak of a similar disease was happening in Cairo, this one known as, quote, the knee trouble. It threw all the people into a fever. Its first attack lasted for three days, after which the illness increased or diminished, according to the disposition of the individual. It was accompanied by pain in the joints, knees, and extremities, as well as inability to move, and often with swelling of the fingers. The after pains lasted more than a month. The onset was sudden, the body being broken by it, and the head and knees taken hold of. So the descriptions of this disease painted this excruciatingly painful picture, but not really a deadly one. Mm -hmm. And that was something that's in sharp contrast to what Benjamin Rush saw during a 1780 epidemic in Philadelphia of a disease that he nicknamed breakbone fever. Mm -hmm. This is often considered to be the first description of dengue fever. And I actually had this passage in my dengue notes, and I don't think I read it in the episode. Oh. So I'm just going to read you a snippet of it here. And also, this is like a very full of quotation section, but I, I feel it. like it's important because yeah. we're yeah, going through historical outbreaks. Okay. Quote, the fever generally came on with rigor, but seldom with a regular chilly fit. When the fever did not terminate on the third or fourth day, it frequently ran on to the 11th, 14th, and even 20th days. In some cases, the discharge of a few spoons full of blood from the nose accompanied a solution of the fever, while in others, a profuse hemorrhage from the nose, mouth, and bowels on the 10th and 11th days preceded a fatal issue of the disease. The pains which accompanied this fever were exquisitely severe in the head, back, and limbs. The disease was sometimes believed to be a rheumatism, but its more general name among all classes of people was the breakbone fever. Mm -hmm. Rush's description, which also mentions a rash and burning in the palms of the hands and soles of the feet, it does have some echoes of chikungunya. Like mm -hmm. there are there are lots of similarities between these descriptions that I've read so far. But it's also much deadlier. Like he's talking about hemorrhaging. Mm -hmm. He's talking about people dying and how often it happens. And that didn't seem to happen in the descriptions, at least from the 1779 Jakarta epidemic, as well as the series of outbreaks of a similar disease that occurred in India and the West Indies in the 1820s, which, like in Jakarta, had a super high attack rate, but a low mortality rate. In 1824 to 1825, an epidemic of Kidinga Pepo began in East Africa and spread to India, where it caused huge outbreaks, with one contemporary observer estimating that 95% of the population of one region was affected. Wow. Yeah. And although this has historically been chalked up to dengue, more recently it's been suggested to have been chikungunya. 
And that's in large part due to the emphasis on the sudden onset, an extremely fast onset and lingering joint pain. Quote, a protracted debility and long continued pains in the ankles and dull aching in the joints of the fingers and toes for many weeks after the cessation of the fever. The outbreak, which also had high prevalence and low mortality, that occurred in the West Indies a few years later, around 1827 to 1828. So that was a description from our firsthand account. Okay. And that's what led to the nickname Dandy Fever. So, <gasps> yeah. What? I, yeah. I remember talking about that. Uh-huh. Oh, my gosh. How interesting. Isn't that fascinating? So he even says, he even writes in that description, like, this is not a deadly disease. This is mm -hmm. not known to be deadly. And it's so funny because I definitely like baited you by being like, Aaron, does that sound like chikungunya? Is this a good firsthand account? Is this <laughs> accurate? <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah. So, so some researchers, you know, over the past few decades have started to think like, hey, well, wait a second. Was that actually dengue? Right. Or was that actually caused by dengue virus, I should say? Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, to think about dengue potentially infecting a new population who has never been exposed versus right. endemic dengue. Because if anyone remembers back to our dengue fever episode, initial infections tend to be much more mild. So if you have an entirely immune population, all of that is going to be primary infection. And it's not until the second time that people are exposed that you have dengue shock, dengue hemorrhagic fever, and severe infection. So especially in an initial infection and in that acute phase, I do think that chikungunya and dengue can be very hard to tell apart. For sure. Yeah. But what I think is interesting is that people made a distinction. Mm -hmm. Doctors who wrote about these diseases during the 1800s made a distinction between dengue mm -hmm. and Benjamin Rush's breakbone fever. So Stedman, who wrote the article where we drew the firsthand account from, uh -huh. uh, he brings up this point in that article, quote, some of the physicians here seem to consider this fever the same as that described by Dr. Rush under the name of the breakbone fever or the bilious remittent fever. I think that the diseases, though somewhat alike in a few symptoms, are essentially different. Four circumstances chiefly distinguish the fever that I have described. First, the suddenness and peculiarity in its mode of attack. Secondly, the well-marked distinction between different stages. Thirdly, the peculiar eruption. Fourthly, the peculiar nature and duration of the afterpains. Hmm. So dengue and breakbone fever were not always used synonymously. And in fact, for many doctors, for a time, they seemed to be written about as similar but distinct diseases, with breakbone fever being this more deadly and debilitating disease and one that you could become reinfected with or like you could be uh, susceptible to multiple attacks is mm. like how it was talked about. And what they called dengue was milder, except for the long period of lingering joint pain. And it was a one time only disease. That's very interesting, Erin. Isn't it interesting? Yeah. And I don't remember it at all from our dengue episode. No. I don't. I think that like there were a few, like I think I made a throwaway comment that was something like, and some people think this could have been chikungunya. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But then, yeah. yeah, with this, it was like there's there's a lot more because I think that's so interesting that like people made this distinction, but in making that distinction, what were they calling dengue versus what were they calling something different, and what what was chikungunya versus what was, you know, new introductions of dengue or first outbreaks of dengue. Totally. Oh, how fun. Isn't it? Isn't it? It's so interesting to think about. And yeah. and yeah, so throughout the rest of the 1800s, more and more outbreaks of what was called dengue or what was called breakbone fever, these were described across the tropics and subtropics. And some observant writers would note the clinical differences between the two. But 
sometimes they would use the terms interchangeably. So how did the two become one? How did breakbone fever and dengue become absolutely the same thing? Yeah. How did we forget about these differences? And honestly, it seems to me like it comes down to just a coincidence. So yeah, like I said, a lot of physicians that wrote about these epidemics did distinguish between dengue and breakbone fever. But by the 1800s, because they're such similar diseases, dengue became increasingly used to describe both. After Aedes aegypti was identified as the vector for yellow fever, researchers became interested in seeing whether dengue was also transmitted by mosquitoes. And (laughs) I feel like I'm not doing a very good job of this, but like when I'm talking about dengue and these historic outbreaks, I'm really should be putting quotes around dengue. So uh-huh. like what they were calling dengue, right. right? Yeah. And so when these researchers decided like, hey, okay, let's see if we can link mosquitoes to this, there was an outbreak of, quote, dengue that was going on in Lebanon, in Australia, and in the Philippines. And these outbreaks provided the perfect opportunity to test this out, this mosquito hypothesis. Using human, quote unquote, volunteers, Researchers successfully demonstrated that the disease was caused by a virus and transmitted that virus from sick people to healthy people through the bite of an infected Aedes aegypti. But it just so happens that the virus that was endemic in these study sites in this outbreak of, quote, dengue was not the chikungunya virus, but the dengue virus. And so It was assumed that this and all preceding historical epidemics that went under the name dengue were caused by this virus Mm -hmm. alone. And the reason I I say coincidence, maybe that's like not really the right word, just a matter of like happenstance, I guess, is because if these researchers had instead been working on an outbreak of, quote, dengue that was actually caused by chikungunya virus. Right. Dengue would mean something different than it does today. It would mean the chikungunya virus or what we call the chikungunya virus. And the virus that we call dengue today would probably have a different name. How fascinating, Erin. Isn't that neat? So at the end of it, we still can't actually distinguish a lot of those early descriptions of, course not. of quote, dengue <laughs> and chikungunya. I mean, we can try, like... But no, that's that's yeah. definitely something that I think is a, a key takeaway. Yeah. Right? Like, this was a very long-winded way of me saying that chikungunya has probably been around longer than since the 1950s mm-hmm. and that it probably caused some historical outbreaks attributed to dengue. But I wanted to kind of dig a little bit deeper because I think it's a fascinating example of how the history of a disease is constantly evolving. Yeah. Whether through the discovery of old texts that, you know, put it in a new place or bring it back even farther, or through molecular tools tracing the actual evolution of a pathogen or a vector, or because modern events add to the story. The history of chikungunya that somebody tells in 10 years probably isn't going to sound the same as this one, the one Mm -hmm. that, you know, we're telling now. And the second reason is that I think this highlights both the benefits of using historical descriptions of disease because they allow you to retrace the steps of its spread and how our understanding grew, but it also highlights the drawbacks. Mm -hmm. It certainly seems likely that chikungunya has been more widely distributed for longer than we initially thought, given some of these historical descriptions being like pretty on the money Mm -hmm. about chikungunya, and also the fact that its vector, Aedes aegypti, or one of its vectors was present in a lot of these places, which would have made transmission, you know, feasible, possible. But we can't know for sure. We can't know whether the author of an account was highlighting an unusual case or a typical one, Mm -hmm. whether they were interested in a certain set of symptoms so they played those up while ignoring others, whether there was some reason that they were like invested in making a difference between dengue and breakbone fever and really like highlighting those differences. These are also similar viruses with a substantial overlap in disease symptoms and geographic range. 
And it's possible that one outbreak of dengue was actually caused by dengue virus, while another was caused by chikungunya virus. Mm -hmm. Maybe another was caused by Onyangnyang virus or a different virus entirely. Mm -hmm. But in any case, these historical accounts aren't just useful for historians, but like you talked about, Aaron, also for modern day researchers looking for clues into a disease's ecology and epidemiology. What do we see on a big scale? What are the things that stand out historically and why? But speaking of modern day researchers, let's head back to the 20th century to see what happened with chikungunya once it was formally identified in the 1950s. So, as you might expect, Having a name, a vector, and a virus made it easier for people to recognize subsequent outbreaks, which occurred throughout the 1960s and beyond in sub-Saharan Africa. Chikungunya was first detected outside of Africa in 1958 in Thailand, and over the next few years, the virus continued its spread throughout Asia, into Cambodia and India. Although it was probably not its first rodeo there. Yeah. Because <laughs> antibodies against chikungunya were found in serum collected from people in India in the early 1950s. And you already heard this whole spiel that I just gave about mistaken identity between chikungunya and dengue. <laughs> But what was happening in the 1950s, the 1960s, into the 1970s, is that the scale of these epidemics seemed to be growing, with one epidemic in Chennai, India, in 1964, causing over 400,000 cases. Hmm. But chicken union didn't maintain this huge growth, because after the 1970s, things seemed to like cool down a bit. Possibly thanks to a high rate of immunity from previous epidemics, it seems like unclear, but researchers have pointed to a possible cyclical nature of chikungunya outbreaks, which I think is interesting. But then in 2004, everything changed. Yep. Or rather, an amino acid in the virus changed. <laughs> So it's been hypothesized, and I think pretty well supported from experimental research, that this change of this amino acid resulted in this viral lineage of the chikungunya virus being able to be more easily transmitted by Aedes albopictus, a mosquito species that previous to this had not really been implicated as a major vector. It was like 80s aegypti for the, you know, urban human to human cycle and then other 80s species for the enzootic cycle. But now suddenly there's this new albopictus species in play. And the result of that was that chikungunya exploded in 2004 from eastern Kenya into islands in the Indian Ocean, involving hundreds of thousands of people and attack rates as high as 35 percent or even 63 percent I saw on one island. Mm -hmm. Over the next years, chikungunya grew to be a major public health problem, causing massive outbreaks in South and Southeast Asia involving millions of people where, for the first time, these neurological and other complications of the infection were observed. And with Aedes albopictus now as this major vector, its potential for global spread grew tremendously because albopictus also extends further than Aedes aegypti into temperate regions. It's a great Urban mosquito that overwinters really well, mm -hmm. like you talked about, Aaron, loves feeding on humans, has these desiccation-resistant eggs. I mean, we're up against quite a lot in terms uh -huh. of chikungunya control. And I do have a little asterisk there in terms of like genotype by genotype interactions between albopictus and the virus. So like some combos don't do as well as others, but mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's complicated, but still. Yeah. Uh, and it gets even more complicated when you add urbanization and climate change to the mix, as you have to do when you talk about disease or vector-borne diseases. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, this is kind of like a rapid wrap-up, but <laughs> I, I think that, you know, what I took away from this is that we have a lot to learn about the future of chikungunya. Mm -hmm. And it seems quite daunting. Mm -hmm. But I think looking at the past, and even like the very recent past, chikungunya can serve as yet another lesson, mm -hmm. along with dengue, along with Zika, along with other arboviruses, 
on just how easily mosquito-borne viruses or other pathogens can reach global distributions. But also, it's an important reminder that we have to consider their individual ecologies and pathologies in predicting future risk. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, dengue's multiple circulating serotypes, or chikungunya's increased transmission via albopictus. It's all very messy, and it's all very complicated, but it's so important. Mm -hmm. With that, Erin, can you tell me what's going on with chikungunya today? Oh, I can't wait to, right after this break. Unsurprisingly, Aaron, <laughs> let me guess. We don't have good numbers? <laughs> we don't. Yeah. It's hard to get a sense of global numbers. But what's interesting and different about the reason why for chikungunya than anything else that we've covered is that chikungunya really only tends to be reported in outbreaks. Everything about chikungunya is there was an outbreak this year. There was an outbreak in this area and an outbreak, an outbreak, an outbreak. And it's like, when do we just start saying it's everywhere? And these are just the cases that are happening. Well, that's a, that's a question, though. I know. It's a real question. I don't have an answer to it. It's like a genuine Sounded like a sarcastic question. It's a genuine question. No, I'm, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm very curious. And like, because it does seem like chikungunya could have like more of a propensity to pop up in outbreaks. Right. Because it does, spoiler, provide pretty long lasting immunity. And so as it races through a population, causes a huge outbreak, then everyone has been exposed and now there's no more susceptible people in that particular population. And you have to wait for new people to be born or to move in or for that virus to move to the town next door. So let's talk a little bit about the numbers that we do have and that we have seen and what chikungunya has been doing globally, shall we? Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, Erin, starting in 2004, an outbreak in Kenya spread throughout the Indian Ocean and persisted for several years, this kind of one big outbreak. It spread to La Réunion Island, where more than a third of the entire population became infected. It spread to India, where cases reached more than 1.5 million people by 2006. By 2007, it continued its spread, and octochthonous, one of my favorite words. Oh, me too. Basically, local transmission was reported in Europe for the first time possibly ever, with several hundred cases reported in 2007. Thank you, Albo Pictus. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was just going to say, is that <laughs> much of those outbreaks in the early 2000s were due to spread by Albopictus. And so the strain that we saw of this virus was this strain that had these particular mutations that made it more able to be transmitted by Aedes albopictus, which is the predominant vector in a lot of these parts of the globe. So that's fascinating, and it was terrifying, right? This was millions of people being infected in the early 2000s. By 2013, if we jump ahead, 2013 is when we see chikungunya spread to the Americas for the first time. In 2013, it was across Caribbean islands where cases reached tens of thousands in a matter of months and then rapidly spread to the South American, Central American, North American continent, with 2014 having over 1 million suspected cases reported to the Pan American Health Organization. Now, these cases, these strains do not have that albopictus gene and are spread primarily by Aedes aegypti. Mm -hmm. So we've got them both all over the world. Well, and how difficult would it be for the one that doesn't have the Aedes albopictus ability to gain it? To gain it, exactly. I mean, it's already done it once. Right. Or the one that does have it to continue its spread. A thousand percent, Aaron. Yes. 
And that's kind of the concern. At this point, in a lot of parts of South America, chikungunya is now considered endemic. And yet still, we mostly see reports of outbreaks. I tried to get a sense of scale globally, just like averages. And I did find one paper that was looking at both chikungunya and Zika virus, but trying to estimate the disability-adjusted life years, which we've talked about on this podcast. These are imperfect measures, but they are one way to get a sense of the impact and burden of disease. And I think in the case of chikungunya, a really good way to do it, because we're not necessarily going to see a lot of death or mortality from chikungunya, but we are going to see a lot of years of healthy life life lost as a result of this disease, and that's what the disability-adjusted life years are measuring. So in the case of chikungunya, these researchers estimated a global annual burden, looking at data from 2010 to 2019, of 106,000 disability-adjusted life years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. which is a lot. A and lot. these estimates were based on case estimates, so combined total global case estimates of anywhere from 50 to 350,000 cases per year. Okay. And we know that, again, that varies because some years it might be more than a million and some years it might be less. So it's pretty major. And again, up to 40% of people infected are going to have chronic or in some cases permanent joint pain and potential disability as a result of this disease. That's such a high proportion. I know. It's, it's really terrifying. One theme that I think we end up touching on a lot in this podcast, and you mentioned it, Erin, especially in our vector-borne disease episodes – are the potential effects of things like land use change, Uh climate change, (sighs) urbanization, and its effects on disease incidence and disease prevalence. And especially in the case of a vector-borne disease that is spread by urban, human-loving mosquitoes like chikungunya, this is a particularly important thing to be worried about. Both of these mosquito species are very well suited for urban environments. So there are a lot of papers that have looked specifically at the effects of rapid urbanization on mosquito density and distribution. And the long and short of it is that it's terrifying news in terms of mosquito-borne disease, not just chikungunya, but including chikungunya. Mm Mm-hmm. Because these papers tend to conclude that urbanization across the globe, not localized to one particular part of the world, correlates with a higher risk and abundance of these 80s mosquitoes. You have an increase in favorable breeding grounds. You have higher larval development rates in urban areas compared to natural areas. You have potential for greater adult survival time. And all of these things mean that you have a potential for greater vector competence, that these vectors are living longer and therefore transmitting or at least having the potential to transmit disease more readily. It's not good news. It's not good news. And then, of course, there's also going to be the effects of climate change. Warming temperatures might mean shifts in vector distribution and vector habitat. They also will mean shifts in rainfall patterns and prevalence, as well as an increase in the strength or severity of natural disasters. And all of these have the potential to, at a minimum, shift thereby moving into new populations, if not also increase mosquito prevalence disease burden across the globe. I guess I didn't mean for this to be like such a bummer of an ending, but I feel like that's I mean an important part. Like arboviral diseases like chikungunya have been popping up throughout human history, always. They have been here with us. And I think that Many of us probably remember when chikungunya was making a ton of headlines in 2013 and 2014 because we had cases in Texas and in Florida, and then it went away and we forgot about it, except Mm -hmm. that it didn't go away. And these viruses, these diseases are not going away. Um, And it takes a huge effort of like multidisciplinary public health work to be able to understand these risks and potentially reduce them. And it seems like an incredible challenge to do that. 
Mm-hmm. Like there's you're working against so many things. I know. I have two questions. Okay. They're unrelated. Okay. The first one is <laughs> about the impact of infection with chikungunya virus in mosquitoes. Does mm-hmm. it have any sort of negative impact? Great question. I didn't see anything on it. So okay. not as far as I know. And I would guess if it's so easily vertically transmitted, then it's not as likely, I would think, to have detrimental effects on the mosquitoes themselves. Follow up related question before I get into my second question. Mm-hmm. Wolbachia. <gasps> yeah. Question mark. <laughs> yeah. I don't. <laughs> so Wolbachia, for anyone who doesn't remember, I think I talked about it in our dengue episode. Sure. Question mark. I think it was dengue. Um, <laughs> well, Bacchia is a symbiotic bacteria that live in a lot of insect species, including mosquitoes. And there is a lot of really interesting research on Wolbachia and other like microbiome bugs that live inside of these mosquitoes and their potential effects on either increasing or decreasing the ability of these mosquitoes to spread disease. I don't have a final answer because I just didn't have time to dig into it, but there does seem to be at least some evidence that some Wolbachia, if introduced to Aedes mosquitoes, might decrease the transmission of chikungunya. So, maybe. Okay. Interesting. Asterisk, so, there's more there. I just didn't read it. There's there's potential. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so now my second non-related question mm-hmm. is vaccine. Yeah. Because chikungunya induces a long immunity. Mm-hmm. It does. So there's a lot of theoretical potential for a vaccine. There's also a lot of various groups and people that have been working on vaccine development. So there are at least 10, possibly more, candidate vaccines that are all at various stages in clinical trials. There's probably one or two in almost every phase, one, two, and three. Most of them are in pretty early clinical trials. But there is a vaccine of almost every flavor. There are mRNA vaccine candidates. There's live attenuated vaccine candidates. There are measles vector vaccine candidates and viral particle vaccine candidates. But we don't have any that I could tell were particularly close to licensure at this point. Okay. Womp, womp. Womp, womp. Yeah. Yeah. But... The potential exists, and there's people working on it. I have a feeling it's largely down to funding. Yeah, as per usual. As per usual. So that's chicken good, yeah, (laughs) Erin. Okay. (laughs) I don't know. Is that enough? (laughs) I think so. I mean, there was a lot there. There's a lot. I mean, there's also, like, it's very clear that there are limitations in Mm -hmm. the knowledge about chicken good, yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to see... What we learn in the coming decades, Erin. Oh, I'm hopefully it'll be a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, sources. Sources. Speaking of learning a lot, <laughs> um, I have a ton of sources for this episode. I will post them all, but I want to shout out two in particular. So one by Weaver and Forrester from 2015 was really great about sort of the evolutionary history and the history of its spread since 1952. And then for the discussion of dengue versus chikungunya and all of that, there's that paper by Donald Carey from 1971 called Chikungunya and Dengue, A Case of Mistaken Identity. Mm, That one sounds fun. I also had a lot of papers for this episode. One of my favorites for the biology was a Nature Reviews microbiology paper from 2010, so a little old, that was called The Biology and Pathogenesis of Chikungunya Virus. Um, And one of my favorites, just because I love this topic, was from PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases in 2021, and that was the role of urbanization in the spread of 80s mosquitoes and the diseases they transmit, a systemic Ooh. review. So I think definitely I have that one, too. Yeah, it's a good one. It's, it's a terrifying. good one, yeah. Mm-hmm. We'll post our sources from this episode and every single one of our episodes on our website, thispodcastwillkillyou.com, under the Episodes tab. We certainly will. Thank you so much to Bloodmobile for providing the music for this episode and all of our episodes. Thank you to Exactly Right Network 
And thank you to you listeners. I hope that you enjoyed this first foray into mosquito-borne virus this season. Sounds like a very specific (laughs) topic now that I say it, but it's not. I feel like we have done our mosquito-borne diseases in very interesting orders. So Totally. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, but yeah. Thank you, listeners. Hopefully you enjoyed this. A special shout out to our patrons. Thank you so much for your support. Absolutely. We can't thank you enough. And... This is our second to last episode, as a reminder. As a reminder. So make sure you are subscribed to our social media and to our podcast wherever you're listening so that you don't miss it when next season drops. (laughs) (laughs) Very well done, Erin. Thanks. Uh, And until our season finale, wash your hands. You filthy animals. Listen, follow, leave us a review on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget, you can listen to new episodes one week early on Amazon Music or early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. You can support This Podcast Will Kill You by filling out a survey at wondery.com slash survey.